Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. Welcome back to our third part of the talk on renal cortical medullary interface. And this is going to be the third and final part of the discussion. So let's really get started. Now, I started mentioning renal infarction before. We spoke about um, renal vein thrombosis, and then we started talking about renal infarct, which could be due to arterial or venous processes. We mentioned renal infarct can be focal or global. More commonly, it's focal. Is usually due to arterial occlusion, sudden and onset. It can be unilateral or bilateral, depending on the etiology. We talk about a cortical rim sign with global infarction. And we talk about chronic renal infarction may be seen simply as a small kidney. Here's a good example of a global renal infarct. The kidney, the cortex and medulla are gone, so you lose the cortical medullary interface and you see enhancement around the edge of the kidney. We mentioned that before with uh, infarction, and that's just from the capsular vessel. So this is a global infarct. The kidney has no residual function. This patient will end up with a nephrectomy. We can see all sorts of reasons for arterial injury. We talk about trauma, but trauma could be iatrogenic. This patient had an aortic aneurysm repair, you see the right kidney and the right renal artery very nicely. You do not see the left kidney or the left renal artery. And this patient had an infarct of the kidney as a complication of the patient's aortic aneurysm repair. We talk about also the point of looking at other organs. I mentioned that before for everything we do. I mean, you have a kidney study, you're always looking at the liver, spleen, nodes, pancreas, bowel, and everything else because diseases often involve more than one organ or organ system. And so when you think about this, you say, well, there's splenic infarcts present, and then there's a well-defined lesion in the patient's right kidney, which is also an infarct, because infarcts often involve multiple areas, particularly when they're related to IV drug abuse or vasculitis. So spleen and kidneys, lung, liver, are all possibilities. Obviously, you can have bowel infarction too, but that is less common. Here's an example, uh, same patient. Infarcts are also present in the lower pole of the left kidney, in addition to the spleen. So a really nice example, multiple low density lesions. If you were thinking about infection, you could be thinking about that, bilateral pyelonephritis, but things are a bit sharply marginated. And then you put together the clinical history, and of course you put together the splenic infarcts, and so you know you're dealing with renal and splenic infarcts. This is a patient who was post-stent in the left renal artery. Non-contrast, minimal stranding by the left kidney is seen, but on the arterial phase imaging, normal cortical medullar interface on the right, markedly normal decreased attenuation, loss of the cortical medullary interface on the left side, very, very nicely shown. Yes, you can go through differential, you can think about pyelonephritis. Of course, the history here makes your life a little bit easier, but also the way that cortical medullary interface looks, the way you see some flow in the capsular vessels, are all gonna be very good for renal infarct. Here it is very nicely shown on the patient's coronal views. And again, a fairly substantial, but not a global infarct of the patient's left kidney. Now, there's been a lot written about sepsis. In patients with sepsis, the renal volume increases and the CT attenuation value decreases in proportion to the severity of the sepsis. So in patients who are septic, you may see just poor function of the kidneys. You may see poor cortical medullary interface. You may see infiltration of the kidneys, particularly if the sepsis is due to renal infection. The principal cause of renal volume increase in the population with sepsis is edema look likely due to capillary leakage or cellular infiltration by the systemic effects of sepsis. However, bilateral enlarged kidneys is not a specific finding. And obviously you can see the differential diagnosis list from leukemia to infection, but again, the history will indeed be very, very important. In this article by De Seferino talking about septic shock and the CT hypoperfusion syndrome, they speak about the things we typically know and that septic shock typically involves multiple organs and the kidneys will indeed 
be one of those organs. That hypoperfusion complex, the IVC is small, the adrenal glands are bright, the bowel may be bright, the celiac and SMA may, may be very tiny. You may see poor cortical medullary uh, differentiation. You may see delayed contrast excretion. You may see persistence of the cortical medullary interface are all things you could typically see. And that again becomes very important uh, looking at all of these findings, but also looking at the kidneys. The kidneys tend to be overlooked as we look at the flat IVC and uh, caliber decrease in aorta and aortic branch vessels. But again, uh, the kidney can be helpful in reaching the diagnosis of the CT hypoperfusion complex. So again, it's something that is very important. Uh, I speak about this in a separate talk, so I'm not going to go through it in more detail. In this article, they do talk about the many things uh, in the kidney, the abnormal enhancement, increased and prolonged parenchymal enhancement may be present. You also may see decreased enhancement because the flow to the kidneys can be decreased. And again, it's not going to be in a hypoperfusion syndrome, renal only. I, I see it first in adrenal, I see at the aorta, I see at the IVC, and then I see the multiple other organs. And so it's something good for you to understand. And again, abnormal renal perfusion in the hypoperfusion syndrome typically manifests as, as increased and prolonged parenchymal enhancement. However, focal and heterogeneous enhancement can be observed. So you can read through this and again, it does show that there is a range of patterns from hyper to hypo enhancement, from involvement of the cortex typically and cortical medullary interface. So I think it's a very important topic. I've put a number of slides in there. I don't want to read them for you, but I think what you could do is when you're listening to this talk, if you're not really an expert on hypoperfusion syndrome, perhaps put the talk on pause and read the slides very carefully. This is probably the best article I saw about this. And again, here's just a really nice example showing you those changes of infarction in the patient's left kidney, the changes in the cortical medullary interface, some changes in the parenchyma, fairly extensive left kidney larger than the right kidney. Now, when we talk about renal perfusion changes in sepsis, just to also emphasize, as I mentioned, the kidney may be the source of the sepsis. You can have a renal abscess. You can have a renal abscess with diffuse lesions. You can have renal abscess with perirenal extension. You can have renal infiltration with loss of the cortical medullary differentiation, which is what this talk focuses on. And again, it can be part of a multi-organ system where multiple organs are failing at the same time. I like this example because on the early images, what do you see? Look how small the aorta is, and look how bright the adrenals are. This patient is hypotensive. You get a brief look at the kidneys, and this patient had MSRA sepsis. But look at the kidneys, the loss of cortical medullary interface. It's irregular. There's multiple low-density zones present. Again, the small IVC, small aorta, bright adrenals, and this patchy enhancement of both kidneys. The kidneys were involved with sepsis in this case, and the loss of cortical medullary interface is very impressively shown. And then you have all of the other findings which make your diagnosis very simple. With sepsis, it could be just um, the perfusion changes because of hypoperfusion, or it could be the kidney is infected as well, which I mentioned was the case here. Here it is very nicely shown on the coronal views as well. The loss of cortical medullary interface, the areas of patchy enhancement, decreased enhancement, and bright adrenal glands, all very nicely shown in this case. Now, there are other things we could see. Uh, Post-arrest, we all scan patients post cardiac arrest. We look for PEs, we look for dissections, we look at all the organs. Patients often can be hypoperfused, which is why they arrest. And again, the things we mentioned before in hypoperfusion syndrome, adrenal hyperenhancement, IVC flattening, bright bowel enhancement, and poor renal function with loss of the cortical medullary 
uh, space. So in this patient post arrest, when they were looking for a bleed, there's ascites present, but looking at the kidneys, the kidneys do show some function, but the cortical medullary interface is just not being shown. The kidneys may be a little bit enlarged. And as you follow it down, there's a loss of the cortical medullary interface. You can see the celiac and the SMA and IMA are all patent, but loss of perfusion in the patient's kidneys bilaterally or delayed perfusion or hypoperfusion, and maybe the best term we could use is hypoperfusion. And when you're dictating this report, you can say there's ascites, there's no large retroperitoneal bleed, uh, but we do see poor perfusion of the kidneys, which is consistent with the patient's hypoperfusion state. The patient did have underlying cirrhosis with varices present as well. And again, I do not see evidence of an intra-abdominal bleed. But again, looking at all these images, again, think about the lack of cortical medullary interface. You should see a bright cortex, less bright medulla in a normal kidney. Here we lose it. And remember, I've shown you now infection, rhabdo, I've shown you rhabdomyolysis, I've showed you tumor infiltration, and now I'm showing you hypotension. Just a very, very nice example of what you can expect to see in a busy practice. This patient also had cirrhosis with varices present and recanalization of the patient's umbilical vein. Now, here's an interesting case. I've only seen a couple of these. This patient was found down. In fact, this patient was very lucky they're alive. Uh, the patient was hiking, did not bring enough water, got lost, disoriented. Uh, the patient was found, they were brought in, they were found down. Uh, you can see the kidneys have areas of decreased attenuation. There's a lack of good cortical medullary differentiation. And this is acute renal failure due to dehydration. It's uncommon, but you know, you read about what went on in Saudi Arabia recently, and you look at climate change, and you look at some people who've been hiking and get lost. This is how they may present with decreased attenuation in the kidney striated nephrograms due to acute renal failure. And here's that same case very nicely shown in the patient's coronal views. Now, another thing I'll just mention in terms of changing cortical medullary interface, which we don't see that common anymore, is due to radiation. Radiation nephropathy is kidney injury and impairment of renal function caused by radiation. Now, because radiation ports are done better now and doses are smaller, it's a less frequent complication. It can occur early with acute radiation nephropathy or it can develop late, but we do see it less frequently but it can cause a bit of confusion if you don't recognize it. Here are changes in the patient's small upper pole right kidney, you might say scarring. This changes in the left kidney, and this patient was having radiation in the pancreatic region, and the kidneys were in the radiation port. Again, with better designed ports these days, this is a, least, a less frequent finding. But again, you want to be careful. You don't start going into polynephritis and infarction. It is, in some sense, an infarct because you have loss of cortex due to vessel injury due to the radiation therapy. But we see that much more infrequently these days. And here's just a few more images showing those findings very nicely shown. Now, we've gone through a number of different things. And there's some other things I could show you, but we only have a limited amount of time. So I think the conclusion would be Always look at the cortical medullary interface. You should see a nice spread between the cortex and medulla. If things are changing, look at the vessels, look at the arterial structures, look at the veins. We talk about the advantages of cortical medullary for treatment planning, for tumor vascularity, but one of the big advantages is just that we could pick up early renal pathology. And I showed you cases with rhabdomyolysis I've showed you cases with radiation. I've showed you cases with dehydration. All of them affect that cortical medullary interface, and that becomes oh so important as we think about a differential diagnosis. So again, cortical medullary interface, look at it on every case. If there's abnormalities, make sure you understand why or try to figure out specifically what's going on. 
And I hope this talk helped you think about this very important topic. And with that, I wish you a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.